Today we're playing Emerald with Pokemon no one uses. Well, not together anyway. The Pokemon journey is simple. Catch Pokemon, build a team, train them, and beat the Elite Four. But most people just play with their favorites or the strongest Pokemon. Today we're putting together a team of the Outcasts and seeing just how tough it's gonna be. Now you know this has to be possible, but just how hard is it gonna be? Well, for your viewing pleasure, I'm gonna put a faint counter underneath the Pokemon. Let's see if you can guess which Pokemon will actually have the most faints by the end. We start our journey with a, uh, not that, nope, not that, yeah, a love disc. Why love disc? Well, its base stats look like this, and its design looks like it does. But really, the big problem is that it looks like it should evolve into this, this, or uh, really this, and it never does. It's farmed for heart scales occasionally, and then it's tossed aside. So it's gonna be our starter. It's that time in the video where I talk about this bogus headcanon that I have. In this game, our gym leader father lives two towns away, and so I think our parents are actually divorced in this game, and Wally is his kid from another marriage. I mean, he gives him a Pokemon, and he won't even let us challenge him until we've proven ourselves. It's whatever. But I do begin the journey to prove myself to my father by beating Roxanne with a type advantage. Paper beats rock, and water is paper. Speaking of water, I try to prove who the better water Pokemon is, and it's Mudkip with a crit, so I level up once and then tackle it, beating May. Now, Brawly was the bane of my existence for like three and a half hours because I didn't want to overlevel in this playthrough, so I did use an X special to give myself a little bit of an edge. I am by no means a good player at this game, so if you can do it without items, power to you. I did get really lucky here because his Metatite kept going for Focus Punch, but Water Gun has a really good chance to hit, so I was able to spam Water Gun till it went down. Charm is the move that really came in handy at the end here because this Bakuhita kept trying to bulk up, but because it only raises by one, and Charm decreases by two stages, we were able to scrape by with a narrow victory and eight HP. It's time for the next valuable addition to our team in Gulpin. Now, I personally love this little poison Squishmallow, but the internet doesn't exactly feel the same. Combine that with these stats, and you get someone who's not well used. Pikachu clones are nothing new now, but they weren't as much of an established gimmick in Gen 3. In Gen 2, we had Meryl, which is only sort of a Pikachu clone, but Plusle and Minin, there we have Pikachu at home. The base stats look like this, and even then, chances are you're not going to play with both, so you're cutting chances of being used in half. I like to consider myself a half glass empty kind of guy, so we're going to take Minin, who we use immediately in our battle with May. But because we have Liquid Ooze, her Lombre actually faints itself, but then her Marsh Tomp has some things to prove with its Water Gun, meaning that our only option left is Minin, who we quick attack with, and then we spark and quick attack for the win. The third generation of Pokemon brought about double battles, but with it came a couple of lackluster Pokemon pairs, like the Bug Pair, Illumise and Volbeat. No, not the 2001 alternative rock band, this Pokemon. And with stats like this and a design like this, now, it's easy to see why it didn't get picked, so we're adding it to the team for sure. Now, Watson is a menace to us because there are good in-game options for Pokemon to defeat him. There's Geodude, who you can get in Granite Cave, Makuhita, who knows Arm Thrust, or Breloom, who's resistant to electric moves and knows Mach Punch, but uh, we don't have any of those. So instead, I rely on moves like Rock Smash to take down Magneton's defense. What this allows us to do is to bring Minin in and do more damage than she would normally be able to do. I bring him down to probably 1 HP and finish him off with Volbeat's Quick Attack. Now, for his Manetric, I have to rely on underhanded tactics like Confuse Ray, but he overpowers our Volbeat. Love Disc is our last chance, and I should have used Takedown here, but I got lucky. You might think you know what's coming up after Watson, so we'll definitely catch a Spinda, but you'd be wrong. That's really nice. <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> but that's really nice. Look, Spinda is an unpopular choice, but we're not catching it for two reasons. One that I'll tell you now, which is that the other two Pokemon left on our team are even less popular. And the second reason is much more petty, and I'll tell you later. Our Gulpin evolves into Wario. We face the team leader of Magma, Maxipad, and he doesn't really pose that much of a challenge. Bum bum bum, welcome to another edition of Shoop's Random and Useless Headcanon Conspiracy Theories. It's a really long title for a show, but on today's edition, we're gonna talk about how 
I think that Maxie is probably Flannery's father. Let's go over the facts. We know that Flannery's grandfather is a former member of the Hoenn Elite Four, and she's got a deep-seated love for fire Pokemon. Throw on the fact that she's a gym leader who never had formal training, and you have to wonder why. Why did she get put in this position if she didn't have formal training? Was it because her dad left to be part of a criminal empire? Maybe. Or maybe I just have too much free time on my hands. Speaking of angst, oh hey dad, nice to see you. This is why we didn't pick Spinda, by the way, because we don't want to be like our father. It's... I'm the king of pettiness. Norman should not be that big of a problem. He really shouldn't. The game gives you plenty of answers to try and beat Norman's team. Lots of fighting Pokemon, lots of fighting moves and we don't have any of them, except for Rock Smash on our Swallet. What we do have is the move Protect, which makes Slay King, much like Norman himself, useless. I'm not projecting, you're projecting. Now it's time to catch our next Pokemon, Tropius. Now, a lot of people do like Tropius. That's not the issue, it never has been. It's a cool design, it's got cool typings. The issue is its stats. We just wish it were better, and it's not. It looks like it should be really strong, but it, it's like this Reddit post says, it's the onyx of this generation, and that's not a good thing. Look, when even the game admits that it's weird that you're getting this Pokemon, it's probably not a primo pick. Let me just say, I don't hate this Pokemon, but its stats are abysmal, and its design, it leaves something to be desired. But it's a really cool concept. Unfortunately, it probably doesn't make it to a lot of Hall of Fames. So we're going to add it to the team as our last Pokemon. Please enjoy the next few minutes of me reminding May who the story is actually about and teaching a few people a lesson in humility. While I tell you the honorable mentions who could have definitely been on this team. First is the other sets to these duos, Plusle and Illumise. I have already explained why their counterparts are on the team, but these would have been roughly the same playthrough. Huntail and Gorobis. Evolving from Clam Pearl, a good design into this. It's a dang shame, but they still have utility and we already had Love Disc on the team. Feebas, while being extremely hard to find and looking the way it does and having the stats it has it still evolves into this generation's Gyarados so Love Disc was the better option. Spinda aside from Teenage Angst it actually has worse base stats than Cast Form but it's got a weird cult following online so it's probably made it to more Hall of Fames. And Kecleon who is also gimmicky and is this generation's pseudo Udo slash Snorlax but it has decent stats and its gimmick is really spammable. Comment below what you used in your first playthrough of Emerald. Let's see how wrong I am. Ah Ah, Tate and Liza, though they put out two Pokemon, they're much more like having a double battle against a single opponent, as they filter in their Pokemon through any available empty slots. I lost a few times here, but was able to win through sheer determination and having more Pokemon. You know the story of Emerald by now, and the last gym leader is a phony anyway, so I'll bore you with something else instead. Ruby came out while I was still young enough that Pokemon was hard, but familiar. It was also the last time I was able to play Pokemon without being called weird for it. I was still a kid. Not a teenager with something to prove, not a college kid looking to escape, but a kid playing Pokemon. And there's something that I wish I could go back to about that. Call it wistful nostalgia or peaking in high school. Call it what you want. On this channel, I get to be a kid again, playing Pokemon. So if you've been watching this video, or any of my other videos, thanks. I beat Juan without much trouble, and then Wally without much trouble, who's not going to get much screen time because Norman doesn't pay any attention to us, totally not projecting. I make it through Victory Road and then on to the Elite Four. First up is Sydney, who we do have a lot of answers for. He takes out a few of our Pokemon, but we end up taking out all of his. Remember, this is not a Nuzlocke, so I can use revives at the end of each match. Phoebe's up next, and for anybody wondering why the levels are the way that they are, I do use rare candies. I put some in so I could use them so that none of my Pokemon will be too over leveled for any one of the fights. I've always thought that it's a little weird to jump into the Elite Four with the level cap of the last member of the Elite Four. This makes the fights all a little bit more hard and a little bit more fair. Just like Kraft Mac and Cheese, we're the cheesiest. Uh, um, that was terrible, I'm sorry. If you leave now, I totally would understand. But we do spam Encore with Minin, and it is a little bit of a cheap tactic, but I couldn't really figure out another way to get past our first few Pokemon. For Cast Form, it's mostly just weather setups. Like, it's cool that I'm able to weather ball her Glacie, but I really needed to be sunny out so that I could use Solar Beam in one turn. And then we get to the last member of the Elite Four proper, Drake. And I hate him and he's terrible. <laughs> See, here's the problem with Drake. If I don't use X speed, he wipes my team. If I use X speed, I wipe his team. So I use an X speed because it's the only way that I could actually figure out how to win here. And even then, if I ice beam his Kingdra, he dragon dances. And this classically has been where I fell, but um, I got kind of lucky here with a crit. 
As I've done with most of my other videos, I'm not really going to explain a lot of what goes on with the champion battle. I'm just going to lay it out there. I do edit this one because the battle just took a long time. There's only a few things that you should note. If I bring out cast form, it's likely to set up sunny day and almost for no other purpose. The same thing is true with Swallet, is I only bring him out if I want to poison a Pokemon, not really to do any other type of damage. I'll see you in a little bit. And just like that, we've become the Hoenn League champion, beating all odds with a truly underdog team that probably no one has used all at once. If you liked this video, you'll love these videos. Thanks for watching.